So now I'm going to throw a, a flattened vase. I've got a little one and a big one over there, that, that big one with a fox on it. So do you, do people in here use B-Mix? You guys like it? I've really, I've used that clay for a long time and I like how flexible it is and but how much strength it has in throwing. So you haven't used it? Made up I think it's got a lot of ball clay in it. But I don't know. It's very plastic, yeah. It's kind of sticky, too. Some people don't like. So do you buy it dry and mix it? No, I buy it wet. And, um, but I mix it with that other clay, typically, with that porcelain. B mix is more expensive than like uh, than 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 Hestia, yeah, probably a little bit more, but not that, not that. It's probably f five cents, four or five cents a pound, more expensive. I'm just cleaning off the floor, yes, yeah, so, yeah. Sorry, I'm cleaning the floor off. I've got, I've left a little bit of clay on the edge here because I'm gonna, on the inside, I want that clay to come down and, and slide in. So when I add a bottom to this pot, I have that like bit of clay down that I can push against the bottom. Yeah, come, feel free to come over. So once, I don't know if you guys saw me do this, but sometimes, when I get out, as I'm opening this up, I usually have to leave a floor in it on this bat and with this clay, because it, or however I do it, it just the pot it slides a little bit and it won't be centered anymore. So I'm gonna push down and in with the outside of my hand, and I'll add a little bit of pressure with my thumb and fingers, and then go into a pull to get to recenter that clay once I've opened it up. And I like these, I like these, um, these oval vases. Yeah. Putting these oval, like putting flowers in an oval vase, it just spreads the flowers out. They, they look better. I have a hard time making a tall, narrow vase that I feel like holds flowers really well and I can decorate and, and is attractive or appealing to people who are buying them. It probably shrinks slightly more. I bet that porcelain shrinks more than the B mix does. Um, it's a little bit less plastic with the porcelain in it, and then it's just slightly whiter. And um, and since I'm using I'm using the clay body as part of the color, it makes that makes a slight difference. I think. I, maybe I'm just doing it to make it harder for myself. I gotta like mix my clay before I can use it. I've I've like design this way of where I slice, I slice the clay and then I put it, I like laminate it together, like two pieces of bee mix with a slice of porcelain in the middle. And then I cut that, the smaller strips, 
and I feed that into the pug mill and close the door on it just repeatedly. And, um, yeah. He's, uh, I just go through one time. Sometimes you can see swirlies in my pots. From You can see like that color difference when it's bisque fired, but typically not. Well, maybe when it's high fired too. I don't know. You should flip over some pots and see if you can, some trimmed bottoms and see if you see it. So I used to, I used to make pots that, we're just more, more about the form than about what was going on on the surface. And, uh, and I stopped doing that as much as I was decorating. But I, I guess my, uh, my current path is to try to merge those two parts of my pottery life together. It's like these forms that are more complex with the decorating. I think also the other issue is that I've got these kids in less time and so I just I don't I have to I have to be able to make uh, a certain number of pots that I can leave in my damp closet and that I can have this really broad time frame of when I get back to them and trim them like bowls and plates or it's like I can trim it when it's a little bit wet I can trim it when it's a little bit too dry but if it's a teapot or if I'm making this like really complex form I've just got to be able to get back to it and there's days when I can't get back in the studio in summertime is the time when I do get back in the studio more often, and that's usually when I make those more complex pots. I'll make like I'll make some butter dishes and and things that just take more time. What percentage of B mix porcelain? So two two bags of B mix and one bag of porcelain, okay. and I lay them out on my table, and I have this these two sticks I've cut little grooves into and I'll put a wire across them, I'll drag them across and I'll put it down on the next groove and drag it across and then I'll like unpeel those and put one B-mix down, porcelain, B-mix and slap them together and stand them up and cut through it and then feed those in. So it's like the sandwich of B-mix with porcelain in between and just stick that into the, put that into the, um, the opening of the pug mill, close the door on it and just do that over and over again. It doesn't take me too long. And my, my oldest daughter loves to come out and help me. <laughs> she'll, cut, she'll, cut it, she'll cut it off and take the clay away. And surprisingly, it doesn't seem like it's that much work that she's doing, but it makes a big difference. Does she ever get on wheel? They do, yeah, both of them. I had this experience where by, probably when she was five and she was home with me one day and we were out in the studio working on something and she has an easel out there. The, the girls have an easel that they can use out there. And so they're out there painting, she's out there painting on it. And I asked her if she wanted to make something on the wheel and she said no. And I said, well, if at some point in your life you want to like learn to use the wheel, you just let me know and I'll, and I'll like sit you down and I'll teach you how to use it. It's figuring like, you know, when you're like 13 or something and you just want to do it, I'm, whenever you're ready, I'll help you. So about 10 minutes later, she goes, all right, I'm ready now. <laughs> <laughs> sat me, sat down. Now my youngest daughter, she's enthralled by it. And um, I can just like stick a lump of clay on there and she'll start sticking tools and I get the wheel going real slow. She'll stick tools in it and stuff. <laughs> and she sat in my lap before we've thrown stuff. And then my older daughter sees that and she gets more excited about it too. So since I have no bottom on here, I don't want to pull the wire all the way through because if I do that, one side is going to get pulled in fun funny. So I'll cut just through the wall enough so I see the wire come through in the bottom and then pull it back out. And you can wait on this till it's tacky, till it's no longer tacky. <laughs> uh, in order to... to round it or to oval it from round but I'll do it right now and I'll throw another one of these and make it rectangular you guys also want to see me so I'll just like squeeze that round and this is what I found is that um, Sometimes I'll get cracks here 
And what happens is as I push it in and it flares back out, I'm basically like compressing the clay and it's uncompressing on that inner edge and that it'll crack later. And it's typically like in the bisque firing at a time when I can't make any repairs to it. So I've been, um, I try not to squeeze them. I was trying to get them really narrow. Like I wanted them to be like, all these problems with cracking. So I tried, I, I decided I wasn't gonna push them as far and I've had more success. And I'll make a little, a little one too to go along with this. I don't have any, I don't have any water in my studio, any uh, running water. So I just have five gallon buckets that I rinse my hands in and clean stuff off in and they get, they get kind of stinky over a couple days, but it's kind of, I feel like I could constantly be at the sink running water. So it's kind of nice that I don't feel like I have to do that. I just. just rinse in this bucket over and over again. I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way I can do that at Guilford where students aren't, so using that resource over and over and over again through a day. We use a You use a what? A large bucket a large container of water. Yeah. We wash all our mats and everything. In that, yeah. That saves. It does, uh, yeah. It's pretty gross, yeah, but I could, I could even just use it one day and dump it out and it would save. Yeah. Sure. How much water would that save? That's what we do. And I could get four of them around it to clean their bats at once instead of just one person at the sink. That's what we do. Yeah. Is this at Art Alliance or is this? Mm -hmm. You see the setup at uh, Carolina Clay Connection? They have this pump. Uh, I haven't, I haven't seen that. Just constantly. <laughs> water just runs through it. Yeah. What do they do about Clay getting into the pump, or they just rinse it out. Fill the hole up. I know where it is if you want to dig some. We can do it this summer. We can do it next week. Um, you, can, you can use it right out of the ground. It, you can throw it. I mean, you kind of have to pick through and get the sticks and pebbles out. But um, but it's pretty it's pretty good for being right out of the ground. All right, so this one I'm gonna I'm gonna square off the the edges. I can also make one of those whirling teapots, like this two that are on the table. That's a long long put together process though. If people want to see it, though, I'm happy to do it. I could open up avenues 
thinking about pots in ways that you never thought about them. Since in some ways that's like the one I do the most elaborate, sort of altering and warping and putting back together. So you, this, when you're squaring things off, there's some potters who will just paddle them, just get in there with a paddle and pa paddle something square. And I tend, I don't tend to do that. But I use this tool. Find those, find those bat pins. This is going to be another one of those like, vases, but this one will be small and boxed off. And the way I deal with the feet, the way I deal with the parts of it's different. What time is it? So again, I don't want to cut all the way through, just halfway. And th so th this was my, when I was having trouble with the pots and they were cracking at the corners, this is the way I sort of solved that if I wanted them to be fairly flat, is to put these compressed corners in. But I did have a couple of these have some problems, but. And I can go back and paddle the edge of this, or I can just try to fix it up now. At Guilford, you you can, while the air conditioner's on, you can have something out in the studio for like a full day and it'll just be getting like leather hard at the rim. With the heat on, you can have it out for an hour before that happens. And uh, so that's hard. Students are always asking me, they're like, how long should I leave this uncovered for? And it's one of those things where it's like, well, if you're, I'm not in here making pots, so I don't really know. Like I don't, I don't have, have a good judge judgment for that. Right, Ray? <laughs> Put it. So I typically wouldn't do this on my wheel head, but it works. I'm just making a slab. I'm going to put these two. Um, I'm going to put these two vases together, or at least the bottoms on them, and get them set up. And I got to throw feet for one, and I'll hand build feet for the other. You guys feel free to ask any questions about about anything as I do this. Global warming? I do. I think about using that kiln at Guilford. <laughs> My contribution. There used to be. We had a, a guy, a guy by the name of Jim Dees at Guilford for a while, who was like the sustain the sustainability coordinator, and he was just sort of like figuring out ways to use less energy or to be more energy efficient, which at a college like, you know, a college that size, there's, it, which is a small college, but there's tons of ways to be more energy efficient. Um, and at one point I was having lunch with him and some other people, and he was talking about, talking about greenhouse gases and stuff. And I said, oh, well, you guys probably aren't very happy with us. We've got this wood kiln. He said, actually, the wood kiln, that's, that's neutral. That's carbon neutral. It's like, all right. It makes some smoke. 
So it made me feel better about that. But then, but the gas kilns, I guess really electric kilns would be the best way to fire work if you had, if you had a choice. You want to be environmentally sensitive. It's not, I guess not necessarily that it could, it depends on where the electricity is coming from. If it's coming from a coal powered plant, then you're probably better, not, in, not any better off, but do you, could you fire electric kiln off of the solar panels behind this building? <laughs> Isn't that kind of a, It's kind of amazing, though, to think that maybe you could, you could plug into that, and that could generate enough electricity to build heat up to 2,300 degrees. So I've scratched the bottom of this, and you can see that I've, I've left that little edge there, on the inside, and this is going to just give me something to push down against the bottom. Oh, the other thing I'll do is, since I've rolled over this, I'm going to peel it back a little bit to make sure it's not stuck down so that I don't have to get it off with a spatula. So I'll wiggle this back and forth until it feels like it really locks onto there, and I'll get my sponge on a stick. If I can reach my hand down in there, I'll use my finger, but this one's a, these are a little bit small. You know what, these work really well for a sponge on a stick where you have this round node in the bottom so that if you get down there and start pushing on something, you don't have a corner that all of a sudden pokes through your sponge and rips a hole. So I'll go around and pack that edge down and try to get a, a seamless area down there. It's not, it's not going as planned. <sighs> There we go. Sometimes I wonder if in a few years, 10 years, 20 years, whether we'll be able to fire a gas kiln, whether they'll let you do that. Yeah. When I was looking, when I was in college and I was, I'd go visit Potter's and um, my grandfather, had a had a house up near Poughkeepsie, New York, and um, there's some little towns around there. Rhinebeck, I think, is Rhinebeck is on the on the Hudson River. It was close to him, and we went over there and met this woman named Nancy Meeker, who was a pretty famous potter at at the time. I guess she might still be making pots. I'm not sure, but she would um, most of her work was like a white stoneware with these like leaf patterns carved into them. She would put a, a little bit of um, tear sage on some pots, parts of the pots, like up around the neck, and smooth those out so it would be like this color change. And then she'd pit fire them. And so they would have this sort of like black to white uh, sort of smoky surface. And they were beautiful pots. She, she did like ACC show and stuff in Baltimore. But she was, I remember her saying um, that she she said, you have to think about where you're going to live and what the rules are, or what regulations they have about firing. She said, like New Jersey, you could never, you couldn't, you couldn't fire, have a gas kiln in New Jersey, I think she said. That's how I remember it. That might not be true, but that's how I, what I remember her saying, or those rules against that. And I thought, well, I'd never live in New Jersey. Like, what would ever take me to New Jersey? And then I married a Jersey girl. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, how funny. Because it's so cheap. Natural gas. Yeah, as I look around, as I look around, I think about moving and having, you know, like building a studio again and uh, at a new house and not having it be my two car garage and, uh, and having a kiln at home. And I think about like, getting a place that has access to natural gas as, as being important, but it's hard to get land and natural gas and be out of a neighborhood 
where you. Do you think I could find some on my property? I feel like one of my former students, I, I, I think he told me this, he was from West Virginia, and I think that they had natural gas being piped out of their property and that they had like free natural gas because that was like one of the deals. All right, so this one's kind of square in the top and I'm gonna make it kind of more square in the bottom with a, with a paddle. Some of this I'll smooth in. I want at some point I'll have to replace the wood kiln at Guilford, and I and when I do that I do think about um, getting wood. How, where does the wood come from? How do you get wood? It's hard to find wood. When I when we first built that kiln, I didn't I didn't find a wood source and then build the kiln. I built the kiln and started looking around for the wood source. And I went on a lot of dead end adventures with students trying to locate wood. I'd call some place and they'd say, I'd tell them what I wanted, off cuts from a lumber mill. And they'd say, oh yeah, we've got off cuts from a lumber mill. And I'd go down there and they had, they had like the ends of trees that were like this big around and like this thick. <laughs> and these like huge disks of, of wood. And uh, I was like, I, I, can't, I can't use that. I can't process that. And... Um, and then, and then the processing it takes. Ray helped me cut some wood the other day, and we get these these pile these like long stacks of wood, 16 feet long. You know these huge bundles of wood, and then you've got to cut this into the size of your chamber, and then you have wood that doesn't fit that size. So you've got all these like scraps of wood, and luckily we have this little kiln that we can burn it in. But if you didn't have that little kiln, then you have like this like tons of scraps, small scraps of wood. But it just takes a lot to process it. And sometimes, sometimes that would be like a chunk this large on one end, or maybe the whole piece is that large. And then you've got to like split this up. So it's three feet, three and a half feet long, and you're splitting this into maybe four pieces. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of hard labor. And, and so with this next kiln, I'm thinking about, well, how can I have a firebox that uses wood the size of fireplace wood that I can use a log splitter and maybe can be harvested from campus. That's when a tree gets cut down on campus, we can take that wood and, uh, and use that instead of having to have somebody drive it to our campus. So that's an appealing thought. And I talked to the groundskeeper at Guilford and he said, oh yeah, that would be, we could definitely supply you and that would be great. And Maybe we could get a wood splitter that we split between both of us and that the shop could use it too because they'll have wood down there that people come by and pick up to use in their fireplaces. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just need a guy with a truck, Ray. Just a guy with a truck. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be that guy with a truck. Now I'm the guy with the minivan. I can't. It's a little bit too new to be throwing wood in the back at this point. Give me, give me four more years and another kid, and then I'll be like, oh, yeah, wood in the back with spiders and snakes, no problem. <laughs> um, yeah. In fact, Ray was telling me that he worked at this uh, brick factory that used sawdust to fire the kilns. And 
Pallets, have you ever taken a pallet apart? Man, they are tough. They, it's tough to get those apart in one piece, like to get those slats off of there. The nails that they put in are kind of spiral down, so you can't. Oh, pellets. Oh, pellets. Yeah, but then you got to buy pellets. <laughs> I'd rather fire with gas. But yeah, there's. The shredded chips. That would be, that would certainly be uh, probably something worth investigating and, and, and doing some research on. Like how do you, how would you, how could you build a kiln that could support chips of wood to burn and then, and then move down into a coal bed or would you need it to move down into a coal bed? The sawdust makes sense to me because you, if you sort of put that stuff into the air, fine mist into the air, it'll ignite. You know, it's just sort of an issue that they have. At this is the problem with, like she's talking about, we would get tractor trailer loads from, uh, you know, logging companies that would just chip the wood. And would come in there and it's fine, it's green though. And then you got to go through a process of drying it. Because that way, you mm. blow it in there, like say, you can just blow it right in on the brick. And once you get it burning, it just ignites right in the air. And it, you know, it, it's almost like a gas. Well, it'd probably clump if it was wet, right? Uh, it just if it's wet, it just doesn't act the same as dry. It doesn't yeah. air float the same, and yeah. So I had, um, we have, we're, we have this, this little train kiln at Guilford, the raised firebox, and there's, a, there's bars there. And then, and then, so you put the wood in, and it lays on these bars, and there's a staircase down into the wear chamber, the big arch. But when that kiln gets about over 1,600, you can put just about anything in it. You can put wet wood in it, you can put green wood in it, and it'll just burn. You know, you have this, like, radiating bed of coals on this slant, and it'll just it'll burn anything and so that kiln's great in that it can eat up wood that otherwise is unusable in a lot of different places but it also puts so much ash on the pots that you got it's not a great functional pot kiln um, unless you know it, I guess it depends on what your version of, of functional pots are or what your sort of, how you define that but So I, I uh, packed that one down, and as I'm, as I'm pushing down on the inside of this one, I'm hearing air squeeze out, so that's a good sign. And then I'll cut around this. These, so these could be left as is, just flat bottom. I've been putting them up on feet most of the time. And I used to put a lot of texture in these when I threw them have like a swirl up the side and visually I feel like they are a little bit more exciting when they are wet like this but um, kind of impossible to, to paint anything on. And that's I was talking about that yesterday of trying to match up these two my former former life in clay with my current life in clay and like how do I get that sort of energy that was in the work and, and paint, be able to paint on it. So I roll this around, I can hear that air squeezing out the bottom of that, clean it up. So this is one of those spots talked about yesterday. 
if you're cutting across, if I go back and I want to trim this bottom edge here and I wait till it's leather hard and I trim across there, I'm going to cut through that seam that I've just packed down and it'll most likely open back up later in the firing. There was a time when I was having trouble with these opening back up. I haven't had as much lately. Typically now, if anything, they're gonna crack up, up in the top. But the, the seam hasn't been opening down here. I'll kind of squeeze it together a little bit, rub, rub over it, squeeze it. No, this one I'll leave round or, or oval and I'm gonna, I will, um, I'm gonna throw a foot for it and, and put it on after it dries out slightly. So these are as far as they're gonna currently go. Oh, this one, you know what? I'll put the feet on this one. So when I'm rolling out a coil, I'm only really pressing in the middle of my roll. And as I'm getting to the ends of it, I lighten up the pressure so I don't get that, that flat, like thump, 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 the coil. All right, where's my, my knife again? It's a little small pot, so I got to think about these feet not being too, too long or they're going to come together on the short side and bump into each other. So thinking, thinking about that short side, I'm going to make these into a slight L shape. And I'm going to leave it long on one end, short on the other. The trick to adding something like this on is how do you do it? For me, it's like, how do I do it quickly or efficiently and not take all this time to try to make it look good, right? And make it like match with the pot without spending 30 minutes trying to refine them or make them look a certain way. I took a big chunk out of this with my fingernail. Oh, and then the other thing I'll do, let me clean this a little bit before because once I get this feet on there, I can't really touch up the, the bottom edge very easily. All right, so I'm going to take that short side, put it on the corner here. This is still really wet. I'll scratch, I'll scratch it slightly and put a little bit of magic water on it, but everything's soft right now. Oh, the magic water. It's got a little bit of sodium silicate in it and a little bit of soda ash and a gallon of water. If you look it up, I think Pat either had a recipe that went around yesterday. Yeah. So I'll push this on here and it's not going to look very good when I start. 
It's all right, though. Oh, the clay's moving around. So typically I'd wait a little bit till there. It's a little stiffer to do this, but as it is a workshop and I'm limited on time. <laughs> and then I'll take this back side of my, my knife and really push these down and in to make sure they're really stuck on. That looks like one side's higher than the other, doesn't it? Cleaning everything off. Now paddle that up and in. Give myself a square or angled, angled little foot. The bottom, the um, that clay that I added earlier is squeezing up along with it too. But there's something kind of interesting about that actually. I, I don't usually have that happen because I usually wait till it stiffens up some before I add the feet on. But then it becomes like this other layer. Like you can see how wet the clay was when I put it together. So I've, I've just been leaving this edge here. If you didn't like that, if you wanted it to look a little bit cleaner, you could grab this, push this rib in to part of that edge and pull it up and sort of define this edge right here by, by ripping part of it off and, and smearing it into the rest of the pot. All right, so that's it. Four little feet, fairly quick. And then I always set these, when they're, when they're drying out, I'll set them on some paper so that they can shrink and move and pull in and I won't and that'll keep them from cracking or warping. So one thing, as I was saying before, with, with having the kids and having this other, going to, to Guilford to teach two days, and so sometimes my, my throwing times are nap time for about two hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays. When I'm busy, I'll go in at night, but I try not to do that when, unless I have to. And sometimes I'll get a little bit of time on the weekend and then Fridays, hopefully I get like a pretty good chunk of time Friday. But there's always other stuff to do. And, um, and so when I'm making pots like this, these vases here, they take a couple steps, and especially this, I'm about to throw this like foot for this vase. And man, sometimes I just feel like I can't get around to making the foot. I think it's a shimpo. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to center this little ball of clay. And this is hard. Ben was asking me if I had any pointers for centering little stuff. Can you guys see on the monitor? I, I just grab it with this part of my hand and my fingers. And I'm going to dig. This is going to be, this is going to be a foot. So I'm, yeah, so from, for that oval, that oval vase that's just sitting right flat on the ground right now. Well, it's not tougher, but um, it's not as exciting. It's like, throw three of these feet as opposed to like some mugs or, you know, at, at the worst mugs, but at the best, like a big bowl or something well, like that. Even though that one day you like, you know, show us something challenging, so you got about six pounds, and like, this ought to be a challenge, but really it doesn't look like one of the challenges. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, my weight that I throw pots at, it's, uh, 
I sort of, I, I throw some things, probably most of the bigger stuff is like six pounds, but then I'll throw some like 10 or 15 pound things. And, but I'm not, I don't throw a lot of big pots and maybe that'll change when I have a bigger studio space and I don't have to take them to Guilford to fire them that I'll feel more inclined to make some bigger pots. And I have made, I've made big vessels before, like added coils and thrown coils and stuff, but I just tend to make smaller, smaller things. All right, so I'm gonna split this now too. So this, this is gonna be like where the inside sits on that like little shelf right there. Can you guys see that in there? A little shelf. I'm gonna lean that back over. So this is gonna be the foot and I'm gonna cut it in half right now. I'll dry it off, I'll clean it up. And my, where'd my sponge go? Oh, yeah, my water bowl. So wipe the moisture out of the bottom. So that's just a little foot. And I've got to cut through it. Oh, my wire fell off, didn't it? A little while ago. So one thing, one way that to cut this in half, um, I'll use my bat pins to give myself a mark for what will be about halfway. And that's much easier than just trying to do it when it's up off the, up off the bat. And again, I'll only, cut half, I'll only cut into the wall and then back out, but it'll move for me anyways. So this should set up fairly quickly. If I put it on, put it on one of these little plaster bats. And I'll cut this in half. So this is the one I threw earlier today. Someone should tell me when it's getting close to three because I feel like I should start painting some stuff at three. And I'll bend that out and fit this around here. Do the same thing with this side. And then I've just got to, I usually measure across here and make sure it's about even. And you wrap it around? Yeah, it's very similar to that. Um, that's a little bit more elegant, though. So, and I'll look down over it, just make sure they look evenly spaced. Whoa, it's softer than I thought. It's, um, it's not quite uh, symmetrically oval. So things shift a little bit and it's got to look right. Measurement sometimes will help, but it's not always the end all. And, but it's really soft still. So everything's going to stick together nice. And I'll just clean up these, this corner here, just soften it up. So it doesn't look like I just cut it. I do this at home too. I'm like always looking for tools around where I'm working. Uh, because Garth Clark owned that gallery up in the Garth Clark Gallery in New York City, and uh, and he could no longer he could no longer sustain the gallery. He could no longer sell work at a high enough price um, after the after the crash after 08 probably, and so he had to close the gallery. 
And so in his mind that meant that Kraft was dead. I'm just sort of amazed by people coming out of graduate school now and sort of like the level of work that's being made like of functional pots. It's really, it's really quite daunting. You know, it's like you look out and just see how many good pots are being made out there right now. The competition's pretty intense. And I don't know, I don't know like how much work people are making. I don't know if they're making a living on it. But there's certainly a lot of good work being made. All right, and then I'm going to work this down and in. It's funny, I'm, I'm right-handed, but when I was growing up playing hockey, I played as a lefty. <laughs> and, uh, and I played lacrosse growing up as well, and I, could, I taught myself how to play left-handed as well as right. And sometimes I do things, left-handed people see me do something, they'll go, oh, you're left-handed too. It's like, no. But I think be, having made pots for a long time, you just learn to do stuff. Your left hand becomes as valuable as your right for a lot of dexterity stuff. I find myself doing something like that with my left hand and thinking, this feels maybe better than it would with my right. It's sort of odd that it feels that way. So I use this rib to kind of cut in and finish this edge here nicely. So since you guys use B-Mix, um, or there's a fair amount of it being used here, at some point if you want me to come out and maybe even just do an afternoon, decorate something, go through the process of spraying it with glaze and firing it. I fired, I don't fire to tin anymore. I used to fire to tin and when, and when I wanted my glaze to drip and move a lot, I'd fire it probably even above 10 a little bit would be the best. Um, but now I just fire to, to 10 just starting to bend. It's probably nine and a half. And then I cut the kiln off. And I was having trouble with my bird beaks turning into balls, you know, like that, that point just like balling up. And I couldn't figure out why. So I just started firing a little bit lower. And the other thing I did was I've, I got this kit with, that came with the compressor. And one of the things was this air spray. It's like thing you could just compress this little lever and it sprays air out, like 40 pounds of pressure. And so I'll go back to spots when I'm decorating and, uh, and I'll spray and I'll like blow the glaze off of areas that I don't want to be as heavy, like the faces of the birds. It's like the body shifts a little bit and the wing becomes like a little bit, you know, like bally. Then that's fine, but if it's like the face or the eyeball, I got a fox that looked like it had like two eyes <laughs> in a weird spot. So that's that, that piece finished. So the having, you know, having that foot up and that a little bit wider. And, look, and I'll put these on paper as well. So that as they shrink, things pull in and I'll cover them up and let them and let them dry slowly. <laughs> 